several years ago now on uh, the NPR show This American Life, a man named Jack Hitt shared a story uh, about his daughter. Uh, at Christmas, they began talking about what the holiday meant, and uh, he began telling her about Jesus, and she was fascinated. She wanted to learn all that she could about Jesus. Um, and so he would tell her these stories, and um, she was really uh, struck by the message that Jesus had. Do unto others as, he, as you would have them do unto you. And one day they're driving in front of a big church and they pass this crucifix and she goes, well, who's that? And father goes, oh, I guess I didn't tell you that part of the story yet. <laughs> so he says, yeah, so that's Jesus. Um, he, I forgot to tell you the ending. He ran afoul of the Roman government and they decided they had to kill him. That the, his message was too troublesome. So some time passes a little after Christmas. Um, she's four years old, by the way. She's in preschool. And her, her preschool is out for Martin Luther King Day. So he decides to take her out for the day to play and have, take her to lunch. And they're sitting there, and at the table where they sit down for lunch, there's the local newspaper and this drawing of Martin Luther King. And she goes, well, who's that? So he says, well, that's the reason you're not in school today. We're celebrating his birthday. And so she goes, well, who is he? And he says, well, he was a preacher. And she goes, for Jesus? Well, yeah, actually he was. But there was another thing he was famous for, and he had a message. So she asks, well, what was his message? And he's trying to explain this to a four-year-old. And he says, well, it was that you should treat everybody the same no matter what they look like. And she goes, that sounds like what Jesus said. He goes, well, yeah, yeah, I guess it is. I hadn't really thought of it that way before. It does sound a lot like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. She thought for a minute. She looked up at him and said, did they kill him too? That episode of This American Life is entitled Kid Logic, Stories of Kids Using Perfectly Logical Arguments and Arriving at Completely Wrong Conclusions. But she didn't, did she? She nailed it. This little girl didn't come to the wrong conclusion. People who really get the message that God has for us, the message of love and equality, of do unto others, of uh, treat everybody the same, no matter what they look like, those people often get killed. St. John says that Jesus came for one reason and one reason only. To give eternity to give the world eternal life by revealing God to it. He says it over and over and over again. Jesus came to be our way and our truth and our life in the world. But the world didn't want him. You have to start to wonder why that is. I think it's important here to note that when St. John says the world, he's not talking about the planet or everything that exists or all people. He's talking some, about something kind of specific. He's talking about the world in the sense that we use it when we say things like the world is just going to pot or the way the world works, right? We're talking about the system of the world. Because that English word world has so many meanings, I find it easier to use the Greek word, which is a word that actually you know. It's cosmos. The cosmos is the power structure that humans create and inhabit in the world. It's the way the world works. It's the overarching reality created by the interaction of all of our systems, governments and corporations and institutions and all these other systems we've created to sustain and protect and advance human existence. And it's important to note that the cosmos is not evil. It's created with good intention and for good reason. But it's fallen. Because any human system, no matter how good, has to seek first to sustain and preserve itself, right? That's what institutions do. But these systems end up seeking to do this even to the point of sacrificing their own stated ethics and morality. 
And that means that every human system in the cosmos, in the world, ends up disappointing us sooner or later. The reason that Jesus and King and St. Stephen, who we heard about a couple weeks ago, all died is because they threatened one of the world's systems. Whether it was a religion, a government, a social class, a race, whatever. And that's what Jack Hitt is trying to explain to his four-year-old, that the message of do unto others as you would have them do unto you is so radical and dangerous because if you take it to its logical conclusion, it threatens the systems that we've created. And so the cosmos reacts. And this reaction, as the little girl understood, is violence. And that's at the heart of the first letter of Peter that we've been reading for the last few weeks. The author is writing to a group of Christians who are suffering hardship because they have believed that message of Jesus. That message of do unto others and love as I have loved you. And they have left behind the path of least resistance through the cosmos to try to live a life that is faithful to the message. Faithful to Jesus' way. And because they are doing that, they are experiencing persecution, perhaps, or maybe just isolation and discrimination from their families and their social circles and their communities. Today, the author says to them, in essence, why are you surprised that life is hard for those following the way? That's the way the world, the cosmos, works. Jesus followed the way and he suffered, so if you follow it, you're going to suffer too. But then he goes on to say that just as real as their suffering now is the, what he calls the glory to come when God himself will restore, support, strengthen, and establish them. And for this reason, the author urges, keep following the way, no matter how hard the cosmos pushes back against you. It's not, the, the reason for this persistence is not for some personal reward. It's the promised result of our faithfulness is not being scooped up into heaven while others burn in hell. It's that, like Christ, our faithfulness even in the midst of suffering, is the means by which God is redeeming the whole world, the cosmos, the very broken thing that resists God. If you don't believe me, just look at Jesus. His faithfulness did not fix the problems of his world. His life did not interrupt the Roman Empire or the Jewish temple economy one bit. <coughs> Some ancient historians, or most ancient historians, have nothing to say about Jesus until his followers start becoming plentiful enough to cause problems. It was his faithfulness to the way, though, that changed the world, even though the cosmos successfully, successfully killed him. Instead of being silenced, his message was amplified. Even non-believers can appreciate Jesus and his story on some level because there's something about it that rings right and true. It's like the way the world or the cosmos ought to be. I wonder if maybe that's what St. John means when he writes earlier that the sheep follow the shepherd because they know his voice. That there's something about this that just seems right. That kind of power is dangerous and it threatens to destabilize the structures that we've created to reform or replace them, which is perhaps why the cosmos must react the way it does in order to protect and maintain itself. And just as Jesus' faithfulness to the way began changing the world for the better, so does ours. We may be too small too weak, too insignificant to affect the change we would like to see by ourselves. 
even as a large group, it takes a lot of time and effort, and we may never see the end of that. But by living faithfully, we are changing how the cosmos works, because we are a part of it. I don't know about you, but I find that tremendously good news. Because it means that even when we fail, and we will, there is still a hope for being saved. Jesus failed. He died. And yet the good news of Easter is that his death is not the end. Likewise, even if we should fail, even if the world as we know it should fall apart and end, the story is not over. God is still doing something. There is still the hope, the promise of this glory that, Saint P that Peter talks about. Just as Jesus' resurrection redeems his death, we trust that God is doing something too that is going to redeem not just the individual acts of evil that we experience, but the entire world, the entire cosmos, all this broken system that was created for good, in spite of itself, might actually be able to accomplish that good. We don't need to save the cosmos because God is doing that. But God is doing it in and through us. We get to be a part of that, not by being superheroes, but by being exactly who we have been created to be. Human beings living according to the way living eternal life. I notice that in Jesus' prayer, when he prays for the protection of his disciples, he isn't referring to preventing harm or death, but to oneness. He prays that they may be one as we are one. And so I wonder if living in the awareness of that unity that we have with all people and with all creation might have the power to do something in this world. Might have the power to help us overcome our fears. I wonder if recognizing our oneness, even with those we would consider enemies, might change our hearts, change how we move through this world as we work for justice. Even if they keep treating us as enemies, what might happen if we treat them like siblings? What might happen to us? What might happen to the world? The story of Easter is how one small act of faithfulness after another creates ripples that spread out and soon the whole pond is shaking. It might seem insignificant, it might not seem like enough, but we have this promise this hope of so-called glory that is coming. The vision of God which cannot be stopped, not even by death. And that's the promise that we celebrate at Easter. Not the resurrection of a single man, but the inability of death to stop what God is doing.